Shalom and welcome, Temple Talk, a project of the Temple Institute's International Department, Jerusalem, Israel. Rabbi Chaim Richman here together with Yitzhak Ruven today, the 11th day of Nisan, 5776. It's April 19th, 2016. And this week, the glorious festival of Passover. Pesach is here. It starts Friday night. It is this week that we will be sitting down to the Passover Seder on Friday night. And you know what? Passover is one of the three pilgrimage festivals upon which the entire nation of Israel makes the Aliyah, the pilgrimage to the Holy Temple. Everything is all about the Holy Temple. All roads lead to the Holy Temple. All roads lead to Nisan, the first of all the months as we learn about in Exodus 12. Passover, the birth the emancipation, the, the redemption of the people of Israel from Egypt. It really, everything is like all starting over right now. And this is Temple Talk for the 11th of Nisan. The truth is, between us, we are recording this one day earlier. In fact, the day that we are recording this, which is Monday, uh, is the day that the practice reenactment of the Passover offering is taking place. It's become an annual event here in Jerusalem. It's attended by many thousands of people. It's uh, almost a full day symposium with many classes that are given by prominent rabbis about the service in the Holy Temple with panel discussions about the renewal of the service of the Temple in our time. And again, focus on the practicality, the actuality, the ability of the Jewish people today to renew the Passover offering because it is so central as we have been learning about for so long now, so central to the identity, to the destiny, to the mission, the purpose of the Jewish people in this world, the whole concept of the eternal covenant of the Passover offering, the slaughtering of idolatry before the whole world, the lies, the lies of the world. Now, the last week on Temple Talk, we had a, a subtitle describing the show. It was posted where we post the, the program. And it said, the Passover offering is the answer to every lie in the world. That was last week's program. Now, what I meant by that was that when you really understand what the Passover offering is all about and why it is the national destiny of the people of Israel, you understand that it is the answer to every lie because every lie is basically directed against the truth of the one God of Israel, right? Their lies are all part of the big lie. So the Passover offering is a very bold, um, you know, um, powerful statement of truth and of faith. And I find it amazing that we made, we made that statement, you know, the Passover offering, colon, the answer to every lie in the world. And then last week, basically, we were confronted with a media firestorm here in Israel um, about the um, wedding rite that we carried out, that we supervised over on the Temple Mount. And it was something that um, we were totally taken um, by storm by the amount of media attention that was played here by the local media that was paid to the fact that the most natural thing in the world, is, as far as I can imagine, uh, for a, a, a couple to want to... Um, tie the knot for a man to betroth the love of his life in the holiest place on earth, in the, in, the, in the sight of Hashem, in the presence of God. Very, very natural. We responded to a request to see to it that a couple could clandestinely, albeit, and which is in itself, of course, a scathing indictment of the situation, the shape of things here in Israel, where every, anything Jewish, any expression of Jewish identity, of religious sentiment has to be in secret on the Temple Mount, because even though, of course, according to every human right and civil right that's been enshrined by Israeli law, non-Muslims are not allowed to express themselves on the Temple Mount. So this, this lady and her husband-to-be wanted to actually be able to do this on the Temple Mount, not symbolically, but the real thing, the real part of a Jewish wedding that's legally binding. The ring with the witnesses and the statement of consecration, and it was done, and we reported on it because we felt that it's a story that is extremely inspiring, strengthening, empowering to the Jewish people who are basically wanting to, to know that they can express themselves in the Temple Mount, who are loyal, faithful to Hashem, the God of Israel, and who want to 
make a statement that they will never forget the Temple Mount, that they will always find ways of expressing their Jew Jewishness on the Temple Mount. And um, it was just amazing what the reaction was. So that's how that, that, was, that shaped very much uh, several very intense, powerful, difficult days for us because we found ourselves really hounded, is the word, by a very hostile media that basically made, made a decision that the byline of the story that they were going to write is that this was incitement, you know, that the Temple Institute is going to cause World War III, that we acted in a very irresponsible way that's going to endanger all the Jewish people because, <laughs> because a man put a ring on a woman's finger on the Temple Mount, okay? This is public enemy number one now. But on the other hand, I also want to say that I personally received tens of emails from women who said, would you please arrange for, m for my marriage <laughs> on the Temple Mount? And I also received a number of calls and messages from prominent people who wanted to give me encouragement and strength about, um, about having had the audacity to do this. And I did get into and am currently perhaps in a lot of hot water over it. But you know what? You do what you believe in, don't you? Hopefully. Anyway, I say all this business about the Passover offering, which is supposed to be taking place this week on Friday, all right, in a normal situation, something as important, as eternal, as binding, as absolutely, irrefutably, irrevocably bound up with who we are would be taking place this Friday because that is our eternal covenant, okay? I'm circumcised, my, children, my boys are circumcised, and in fact, uh, tomorrow my new grandson is going to be circumcised. And the same degree of severity is how the Torah considers bringing the Passover offering. So why aren't we doing it on Friday? Well, ask, ask the Prime Minister. He doesn't want us to do it. But you see, by the fact that there are thousands of people that are gathering on, on Monday this week, right? to reenact, to practice, to familiarize themselves with how to bring the Passover it means that the people of Israel are really coming home to this. But listen, as I began to say, so last week I'm saying, okay, Passover offering the answer to all the lies in the world. Guess what? I'm a prophet. I didn't even know it. Okay, Passover offering the, the answer to all the lies in the world. Guess what we have to deal with now? We have to deal with <laughs> An even bigger lie, if you thought you heard them all. Now we have the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, otherwise known as UNESCO, which is an organization that's known for its total duplicity, its, its absolute Jew hatred and desire to destroy the people of Israel at all costs. Now they've come along and they've made a resolution. The resolution was made this past Friday that the Temple Mount has no connection whatsoever with the Jewish people, that it should only be called a Haram al-Sharif, that the Kotel, in, in, and it's, it had in, like, exclamation marks, like, what do you call it, like, you know... Quotation uh, marks. Quotation marks, I'm sorry, in English. Uh, as if, like, oh, the cutesies, they refer to it, the Jews, as the, as the Western Wall, but it's really the Al-Barak wall, Barak, whatever. And it said that the Jewish people are destroying Muslim and Byzantine sites, and... and, and um, falsifying history and uh, and planting false graves. I don't remember exactly. Anyway, the point is, this UN, United Nations Educational, Scientific, Cultural Organization, UNESCO body, declared that the Temple Mount is not Jewish. The Jewish people have no connection with it whatsoever. Well, talk about a firestorm from, the, from all spectrum of the Israeli... Uh, establishment, you have secular left-wing ministers, as well as our prime minister, who are who are absolutely slamming UNESCO for their unmitigated gall, for the lowest level that they've now stooped to, as Netanyahu says, that they could have the audacity to deny Jewish history, to rewrite history, and to uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, Netanyahu was very, very angry. Very, very angry about this. Well, guess what? So are we. But our anger is much more, I would say, tempered and balanced and um, directed. 
because you have to understand, and this is the background of the press release that the Temple Institute released as a as a um, um, rebuttal of the UNESCO's resolution. And the headline of the press release that we published is that, just like, I mean, this was a takeoff because Netanyahu's press release was that Netanyahu slams UNESCO. So our press release is that the Temple Institute slams a succession of Israeli governments whose policy has led to this ridiculous situation. In other words, why do you think that UNESCO had the sheer chutzpah to say something so ridiculous that any academic, that any clergyman, that any student of history, how could, how could UNESCO fly in the face of the Bible, which is the bedrock of civilization? Archaeological evidence. The, t the two temples stood for almost a thousand years, and there's so much evidence and of course, the Muslim Waqf has been systematically destroying the archaeological evidence for decades, and the UNESCO didn't say anything about that, even though UNESCO is very, very angry about the archaeological destruction of things that the Taliban did, for example, and ISIS. But anyway, back to my point, how do you think UNESCO is able to say this in the first place? It's very simple, because Israel's policy towards the Temple Mount is it to, be, to be polite, ambiguous nebulous, ambivalent, totally, totally skewed and unclear because on the one hand, they tout this tired mantra, the beautiful romanticization of Matagor's immortal words from June 7, 1967, Harabai Biadenu, the Temple Mount is in our hands. But on the other hand, you know, Jewish people, and all non-Muslims for that matter, are not allowed their basic human, civil, religious rights to pray at the Temple Mount, even though the State of Israel repeatedly, over and over again, tens of times, the High Court of Justice has upheld the right of the Jewish people to pray on the Temple Mount. But you know what happens if they try to pray, if they try to say Shema Yisrael, if they have an Israeli symbol, even like a flag, if they try to pray, it's the worst thing of all. They are removed. And look what happened last week. Look at the huge firestorm of criticism the names that I've been called now, <laughs> unbelievable, unbelievable criticism by the Israeli left and, by the way, by the Israeli right and by ultra-Orthodox quarters as well, names that I've been called for, and I didn't even do anything, right? I didn't even pray. All I did was I arranged that a couple should be able to do their marriage ceremony, their marriage vow on the Temple Mount. <gasps> How could you do such a thing? You're public enemy number one. You're the most dangerous person in the world. You're worse than ISIS. You're worse than the Iranian threat. You are the biggest problem in the world now because you did that. So then comes along several days later, after, after I have gone through this entire you know, thing being in the eye of the storm, several days later, UNESCO comes along and says, the Temple Mount is not Jewish. And, and the Israeli leaders are like, how dare you? Th what, that's the most horrible thing you could possibly say. How dare you get a, say such a, such a lie? Well, the way that they're able to say it is because you, Israel, you, Netanyahu, you empowered them. You empowered them with your, with your um, absolute lack of integrity, your lack of confidence, your lack of the, of the, right, of the conv conviction of the righteousness of your own path, with your mixed messages, with your fear of, of Islam that has you so twisted and so tied in knots that you are totally insensitive to all Jewish sensitivity. That's why UNESCO comes along and makes a statement like that. It's coming out of your mouth, you hypocrite. You heard it here, people. <laughs> Nothing less. No, the rabbi is, is 100%. You're on the money, rabbi. I mean, Israel, the government of Israel treats the Temple Mount like some kind of playing card, some kind of like a, a, like a bargaining like a, chip. A, 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 a bastard stepson, like a pariah, like a yeah. liability, like an albatross around our neck. Like it's just something that we have to just get rid of. In, in fact, back, back in the days of Ehud Barak and his former minister Shlomo ben Ami, they offered it to Arafat, but by some miracle it wasn't good enough for Arafat. <laughs> Nothing was good enough for him. He didn't take it, but they offered it. They don't want it. They never wanted it. It is the biggest problem 
What did Moshe Dayan say? He said, who, he needs, said, this who needs this Vatican? Who needs this Vatican? He said in, in 67, right immediately after Israel liberated the mount, he said, who needs this Vatican? He wanted and, to give it back. And that's right how away. they're talking about the Temple Institute now, because all because of the fact that we uh, saw to it that a man was able to put a ring yes, on a the finger of a girl on the Temple Mount. I didn't, we didn't make any noise. Nobody knew about it. Yes, we advertised it after the fact because we felt it was very important to inspire our people to know that they can always find a way to express their Judaism on the Temple Mount. We didn't confront anyone. We didn't do anything. And yet, Many of the articles this that is such a terrible problem that we did this. And so, so uh, you're surprised, right? And as the whole, the whole country, it's, as, as my British friend says, their knickers are twisted. Does he say that? <laughs> They're in a knot. Over this wedding on the Temple Mount, and three days later, UNESCO comes along and makes a resolution that the Temple Mount is not Jewish and has nothing to do with the Jewish people, and Netanyahu's knickers are all twisted. Well, guess what? What do you think is going to happen when you broadcast to the world that you, you, the total degradation of the Jewish people on the Temple Mount? How could you come along afterwards and say that it's yours? Part of the firestorm uh, was a uh, very uh, extreme left member of Knesset who immediately was incensed by what we did, although she repeated herself that, uh, yes, of course, uh, we're entitled to have complete rights on the Temple Mount, but not now, which is, is, is one of the grossest, disgusting things you can say, that yes, people, yeah, people are entitled to be free, but not now. Yes, well, you know, there should be no inequality, but not now. Yes, people should be able to sit anywhere in a bus, but not now, not yet, some other times, in the future, in some glorious future. They have future. to be able to, you know, but, to but this, But this particular me member of Knesset has called for an investigation into the Temple Institute, where who gets some funding, not very much, but some oh, funding, from the, funding. From, the, from, the, from the government, and it should be investigated, and the funding should be cut off, because we are inciting, and we're extremists. Because we believe what the Jewish people are all going to be saying, and, even and, uh, even her, even Zahava herself, if she's sitting down to a seder, which I don't, I don't doubt that she might go to a seder. I mean, she's Jewish; she might go to a seder. Every seder in the world ends with the words, with the words, "Next year in Jerusalem, the rebuilt Jerusalem," is a reference to the temple. And this guy that wrote a blog in the Jerusalem Post today that called me, uh, whatever it is that he called me, and said that we are... Messianic extremist. And, 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 and all that, that jazz. Does he know me? Does he know my truth? Does he know me? Does he ever, <laughs> did he ever speak to me? Did he ever ask me? And he's talking about how we are going to foul the air with animal sacrifices, he said. I don't even eat meat. He's probably having his hamburger right now, but we're going to foul the air with animal sacrifices because it doesn't fit in with his agenda because he has no conception or idea whatsoever of the paradigm between man and God whatsoever because he doesn't listen to my classes on, on Leviticus. I'm sorry. Yeah. There was also uh, a number of articles last week uh, talked about uh, a group of, I don't know, three, 13 people who were with us that uh, that day in the Temple Mount who created some kind of diversion. So the, and, was, and, and, the, there was, and there was footage that was actually taken by Muslims at the time. which Saying which they, this, is the, this is the wedding ceremony. Which it wasn't at all. It wasn't the wedding ceremony, that part of that video at all. It was so ridiculous. And the media, they distorted everything and they absolutely lied just for which the is, ride, I, just to go I, along I, for the ride. Which is quite they common. made it all up. They said, oh, but, one person uh, had a specific job who, who was to divert the attention of the police. They couldn't have spoken to anyone because nobody knew about it whatsoever. It was all made up because they needed to be able to get to the last line of the story, which is this is going to cause. Uh, they called it. They called it like a wedding of incitement. Uh, right, they, right. It yeah, it's a new intifada. How many people are going to die because of this? How many people will be killed? And our major concern throughout this firestorm was to protect the identity of the couple who had asked us you know, to keep their identity secret. They were happy that we were, we were going to talk about the story, but we, as, as anybody who saw the pictures we posted, it was very clear that we weren't showing any faces. And so we were very concerned that uh, their identity should not get out, and we were succeeded in that. After the, the storm died down a bit, they apparently agreed. After about be, 36 hours of media attention. To be interviewed, uh, again, without their names and, and without their, their pictures. And their faces blurred. And spoke but because very, they very beautifully. Yes, they spoke very beautifully in this Hebrew language interview in Idio Dachronot because they realized, as we realized, that this story is not private. It's not about two people. It's about the, the Am Yisrael. It's about the nation of Israel. And so they acquiesced to speak. They spoke beautifully, and their identity was still protected. And that was our main concern throughout and, and uh, they made a very important point, which was the fact that all the excitement, and positive and negative, right, either those who were, who were thrilled and those who, 
who supported it and, and want to get married in the Temple Mount and those who condemned it, it struck a nerve for everyone because it is our identity. Uh, the Temple Mount is where we're supposed to be. It is it who, is who we're we about. are, as, as is demonstrated by this week, by the fact that there are thousands of people on Monday that are reliving the, the Passover offering. <clears throat> the fact is, you know, the, 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 the media, some of the attention, some of their approach to us, some of their uh, attempts to pin us down what was vicious, absolutely vicious. But that wasn't the reaction of the people. The reaction of the people was romance. They were absolutely in love, in love with Hashem, in love with the possibility of identifying and expressing themselves as true Jews. And that's what Passover is all about. And that's, and, 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 and that's why this whole ridiculous thing, it's almost like a divine retribution that, that now the, the country is in knots over UNESCO. How could you say such a thing? How could you say such a thing? Because look how you act. Look how you react when Jews try to express themselves about the Temple Mount. Decide which way is it? Which way do you want it to be? Do you want the world to recognize that the Temple Mount is Jewish? So start acting and, like it. And two days after the uh, UNESCO announcement, a Jew was arrested on the Temple Mount for uh, quoting a verse from, from uh, Psalms. He was uh, trying to explain something to the people with him. He was uh, giving a class and he, and he was talking about how what would be said here at the Temple Mount, and he used the phrase, David's phrase, King David's phrase from Psalms, Anna Adonai Hoshi Anna, please, O oh God, r deliver me. And the policeman heard it, and he was arrested. Unbelievable, unbelievable. And then, and then you're wondering, how could UNESCO get away with such a thing? They get away with such a thing because they look at you and that you, Israel, you, Israel's government, and they see that you have nothing but contempt for your own people. And your own God and heritage. And there's a new story in the news now. The new story is that they've, they have a new expose and they discovered an, a, a group, a clandestine group that's funding the Morbiton the, the, and the Morbitanuts, the, 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 the uh, Muslim screamers, women the and men mercenaries who, that will lay in wait for the Jewish visitors to, to attack them and to make that, their visits difficult. And, you know, every couple of months you hear that they've been outlawed and, and that this organization has been outlawed and disbanded and that organization and these, this one's been arrested and that one's been arrested and then you turn around and, and it seems like nothing's been done. We'll be talking more about the Temple Mount, the Holy Temple, and the glorious festival of Passover. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Temple Talk. Welcome back to Temple Talk. This is Yitzchak Ruven with Rabbi Chaim Richmond from the Temple Institute here in Jerusalem, Israel. Today is the 11th day of Nisan 5776, the 19th of April 2016. And uh, actually we're recording this show a day earlier, but uh, we'll be posting it on the day I just mentioned uh, because of our pre-Passover uh, preparation schedule. This is how we have to do it this week. Uh, I will mention also that we will not be recording next week, of course, because it will be Cholom Moed. It will be the intermediate days of, of Passover. And our next Temple Talk will be recorded and presented on the 3rd of May, the 25th of Nisan. That's in two weeks from today. Um, this Shabbat, which is also the first day of Passover, because it's the first day of Passover, there's a special Torah reading for Passover, and the usual... Uh, Parsha, the usual weekly Torah reading, which would be uh, Achrei Motz, will not be read this week. It will be read the following Shabbat here in Israel. But uh, there'll be a discrepancy with, with the Diaspora uh, Torah reading because of an eighth day, uh, an extra day of Passover in the Diaspora. We're not going to get into that right now. But this is the reason why we're not talking about Achrei Motz yet, because it's not going to be uh, uh, the weekly Torah reading in for another week. Rabbi, uh, we were talking about the Temple Mount. I think we've said what we had to say, but there's always more. But uh, there's also another situation now here, and that is that apparently the United States, uh, Reed Obama, 
and uh, Russia, read Putin, uh, decided that uh, they're going to, I guess, kickstart the uh, Syrian, quote, peace talks by doing what, what, what everybody does when there's peace talks in the world, and that is get Israel, Israel involved and, 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 and try to pressure Israel into giving something up. And in this case, what do they want Israel to give up? Why? Well, then call on heights, of course. So Netanyahu, nobody's fool, and uh, adamant about uh, uh, that Israel will always be on the Golan Heights, held a cabinet meeting today in the Golan Heights. This is a, you know, a... A, a symbolic a gesture. Symbolic gesture to demonstrate to the world that we are here forever. And Syria he called it a, a provocation. Syria was very, very upset about the photographs. It's a firestorm. The whole cabinet sitting at these folding tables on the beautiful grassy knolls of the Golan Heights. So, Rabbi, you, you uh, expressed, uh, asked a question uh, just before we went back to the microphones uh, concerning this. Okay, so if Mr. Netanyahu is holding a cabinet meeting on a Temple Mount. I mean, excuse me, I just <laughs> gave it away. I just gave it away on the Golan Heights because the United States uh, and Russia are scheming to try to strip that away from Israel. What about the Temple yeah, Mount? Where's I, the cabinet I, that's meeting? That's what I said, not a question, a statement. I'd like to see him hold a cabinet meeting on the Temple Mount. Well, that'll send a message. It sure would. It won't involve prayer, I'm sure. Uh, what's wrong with it? What's wrong with the cabinet Because meeting? that's a message that he's not prepared to send. He's only prepared to criticize UNESCO for following his lead, and he's only uh, he's only prepared to authorize the police to arrest, you know, children and and uh, holy Jews for saying Shema Israel and this kind of thing. But he's not prepared to actually um, actualize the the rights of the Jewish people to pray there. Right. It's all a bunch of rhetoric, and that's where it ends. So. Well, you know what's interesting about that is that rhetoric is lip service, mm -hmm. and that's what he's playing here. Yeah. But actually, if you look at the expression lip service, you could turn that around into something very holy, the service of the lips, because mm -hmm. actually that's what Passover is all about. But the real thing, not sarcastic, cynical, manipulative, empty words of lip service, but really speaking and praising Hashem, as we spoke about in, in uh, Parshat Mitzorah, the power of speech, the idea is that Pesach, which of course means passing over, and it is, it is about how Hashem passed over the houses of the Jewish people, and at the slang of the first moment, it's also about the fact that he literally passed over time and, and, and skipped, like the Hallel Professor Perez talk about how the mountains skipped like lambs, right? Mm -hmm. Because we skipped out of Egypt, like even earlier. Okay, but Passover also, our sages tell us, is, is like a play on words, a contraction of the two words, Pesach, which means a, a mouth speaking. Because the main aspect of the commandment of sitting at the Seder, on Passover night is vehigadata levincha bayom hulemor, right? To say over to your son on that day, saying, This is because of what God did for me when he took me out of Egypt. And as the Haggadah says, even if we're all wise, if we're all old, even if we all know the story, and the halacha is even if a person is sitting by himself and, and knows the whole story and he's making a Seder, you have to speak out the words, to praise of Hashem. So recognition. What, it's all about speaking, it's all about speech. It's all about recognition of exactly of the miracle, and the way and that we the way that we express our recognition is by is by speaking, just as we should be doing on the Temple Mount as well. And the whole Passover experience is something that um, is it transfixed the people of Israel. It transcends every generation, and it basically is a legacy for all humanity because it really is about freedom from bondage. And that is to say also the, the bondage that we still suffer from today, the bondage that we have to our, each of us, to our own form of idolatry, whether that idolatry is substance addiction or psychological addiction or political correctness. The, the, all the places in our lives that we are not completely f real and free to choose between good and evil, the places where we are not able to stand up and declare the oneness of Hashem, that is a type of idolatry. And that's what Passover is all about. It's about getting free from all of that. And we have the potential to do that on Passover. That's the beauty of, of the whole concept of the Jewish 
take on time, on the cycle of the year. We've always emphasized this. We don't, re we don't commemorate something that happened a long time ago. That's not what holiday observance is about. What Shabbat is about every week. It's about it's happening now. And Passover is the time when we are able to truly gain freedom from the dark places, the places of constricted consciousness in our own lives. And that's what we should be aiming at when we sit at the Seder. And uh, how ironic it is that the th main thing that's missing, of course, is the main statement of our faith, is the Passover offering. And, and thank God, in our generation, there are more people working towards the fulfillment of that goal than since the destruction of the temple. There is more of an explosion of consciousness of the, of the, of the Jewish people's identity and our eternal bond with God to bring the Passover offering than ever before. But Passover is first and foremost about recognizing that God really did take us out of Egypt and we can do it again. The sages said that in Nisan Israel was redeemed and in the future too Israel will be re redeemed in Nisan and this month. This month is the, is the beginning of all months as the Torah tells us in Exodus 12. This is like the headquarters for all renewal, for all the opportunity to become new and to start over again. It's all beginning right now. And then of course we have the beautiful idea of how you know, we left Egypt on the night of Passover, and a week later we found ourselves at the banks of the Sea of Reeds, and on the Shvi'i Shal Pesach, on the seventh day of Passover, we, pa we passed through the sea triumphantly. And the whole idea of marching towards the land of Israel, marching, marching towards... towards Mount Sinai towards the receiving of the Torah, which is, of course, the, like the constitution of the Jewish people. And marching towards, uh, towards Jerusalem and, 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 again, in the Holy Temple, which is mentioned in the Song of the Sea, that that is the goal. The moment that Israel was, was completely past the Egyptian threat, the Egyptians were, were drowned in the sea, and the moment that Israel stepped on or, or stepped across the sea, free, free for the first time, the song that they sang culminated in, in recognition that we're headed toward God's holy mount, our inheritance, where we will build a mikdash, a temple. That, from the start, was the goal of the Exodus. That's from the start, when, when God first talked to, to, to Moshe at the, at the sne, at the burning bush. That was the plan from the very beginning, that uh, it wasn't simply uh, to get us out of Egypt, it wasn't simply to get us into Israel, but it was to get us into Israel and for us to build a house for Hashem so that Hashem could dwell among His people on this earth. You're referring, of course, to the Song of the Sea, right, Az Yashir, to Exodus 15 and verse 17, where we will read, you will bring them and implant them on the mount of your heritage, the foundation of your dwelling place that you, Hashem, have made, the sanctuary, my Lord, that your hands established. And that is refer a reference to the people of Israel building the Beit HaMikdash on Mount Moriah. And so we're not allowed to pray there. And uh, we had a firestorm because someone got married there. And uh, Netanyahu is upset because of UNESCO, et cetera, et cetera. Hello, <laughs> it's been 4,000 years, people. You know, get I with mean, the program. Honestly, his, his reaction to UNESCO is, is just so laughable. It's like, it's like, he, it's like a parody. It's like, he, it's like some kind of sitcom where he's like saying like, don't you tell the Jewish people they have no connection to the Temple Mount. That's my job to tell them that they have no connection right. to the Temple Oh, oh, but of course, no, my thing is I'm saying to them, well, you have a connection, you just can't use it. You just well, can't he, express he, yourselves right. there. So what he said in his statement about UNESCO, he said, he said, you know, it was the place where two temples were built that stood for a thousand years, and for thousands of years, Jews have been praying to that place. But So he defends our right to pray to that place, <laughs> but not on that place. Pray to that place, meaning we pray for it to be rebuilt. Ah. But we're not allowed to okay. move our lips on the place. What's so, that all so about? So he's saying... You're we, allowed. This is like allowed to mourn. I think you know how to take the right. reservation. I just don't think you know how to keep the reservation. I think <laughs> he's saying you're allowed to pray to that place. You're just not allowed to pray 
at that place. We're allowed to long for exactly. it. Exactly. We're allowed, allowed to, to pray about it. We're allowed place. to. We're allowed to continue our, our exile experience for the place. You're allowed to romanticize the pain. You're allowed to want it to come about, but, but don't you dare don't try, try to, to actualize it. it. <laughs> but if you actually do something about it, you'll be really in trouble. Well, you know, parallel to the uh, an upcoming Passover experience, interpolated onto Passover, beginning in Passover, the second day of Passover, the conclusion of the first day at night, we begin a commandment in the Torah. The commandment is also a temple-related commandment. Mm -hmm. Netanyahu will be so happy. The temple is is just popping out everywhere. He's so right. It's absolutely part of our, our of our Jewish heritage. Absolutely, Leviticus twenty three describes the counting of the Omer. The word Omer is a measurement, and actually, what it refers to Leviticus twenty three refers to the fact that at the conclusion of uh, the first day of Passover which is here described as, I'm sorry, I said, I said, did I say Leviticus or Exodus? I meant Leviticus 23, Parshat Amor, right? We read here, you shall count for yourselves, it's starting in verse 15, from the morrow of the rest day, is the way our school translates it. It's called Mimacharat HaShabbat, which of course our sages teach us is a reference to Passover. From the day when you bring the Omer of the waving, Seven weeks, they shall be complete. This is referring to a, a particular offering that was brought to the Holy Temple on the evening, or that is the beginning of the 16th of Nisan, when the representatives of the Beit Din and the Kohanim of the Holy Temple would go to the fields and they would cut the new barley, and it was brought as a wave offering to the Holy Temple. It was sifted and roasted and brought to the temple and this is a very significant event this omer this measurement of seorim of barley from that time on that was the time to begin eating the new grain there's two things going on at once here one is that there is a positive commandment to bring the omer of barley and the other is simultaneously we begin counting we begin counting, which we also call the counting of the Omer, which is actually a reference to this period of time of, as the Torah calls it here in verse 15 of chapter 23 of Leviticus, seven weeks they shall be complete, seven complete weeks, until the morrow of the seventh week you shall count, fifty days, and you shall bring, you shall offer a new meal offering to Hashem, and then it talks about the two loaves of bread that are brought as a special offering on Shavuot, on the festival of weeks, the giving of the Torah in the Holy Temple. So we have here a commandment, which is a very serious and beautiful commandment and a tremendous opportunity for spiritual growth, which is that we actually count aloud every night for seven weeks, we count the days, and then after the first week we begin to count the weeks and the days. And this is a an experience which actually has potential for tremendous spiritual advancement Usafartem lachem, usafartem lachem, literally means that you shall count for yourselves. But the word usafartem, sfira, to count, is related to sipur, which is to tell. It's related to sefer, which is a book, which of course is a story. It's related to sapir, which is a sapphire, because this is the beauty of Hebrew, how all of these things are related. It's a very deep level of understanding. And the idea is you're counting, you're counting, you're telling over, you're telling over a story, it's whose story is it? It's your story. It's your unfolding story, the, un, the ongoing story of your, of your own life. And you have to tell it over, and you have to count and make each day count and make each day shine like the sapphire. And that's what this is all about, because the, the tradition is that when we left Egypt, okay, the first night is coming up this Friday night, we left Egypt. We left Egypt in a huge upheaval of spiritual chaos in a way because Hashem in His tremendous compassion took us out of Egypt, took the people of Israel out of Egypt and they weren't really ready spiritually. So He took them out but then they needed to begin to prepare themselves so that they would be able to stand at Mount Sinai and really be completely um, freed from their slave Make up their slave mentality that they that they had from being in Egypt, 
And that's what this counting of the Omer is all about. It's about shedding many, many layers of superfluous skin. It's about, it's about confronting all sorts of powerful personality issues. These seven weeks are known to be propitious for personal growth and progress. We have a special project this year that we're very excited about. We're going to be counting together with our friends all over the world. We're going to have a, you'll see, you'll see. Tune into the Temple Institute's Facebook page. We're going to count the Omer every single day together. So, and uh, next week, there will also be, just like this week, there is the Tirgolet, there is the practice reenactment of the Passover offering. Next week, as we've done in past years, will be a practice reenactment of the of the, the cutting of, of, the, the, cutting the, of the Omer and and the, the the roasting and the offering of the of the barley, uh, as it was done in the Holy Temple, uh, by us uh, messianic. Uh, right wing, right -wing extremist, extremist, dangerous. That are going to foul the air with our with our with our uh, our roasted barley. <laughs> yeah, we're crazy. You know, if we're not doing it, uh, if we're not slaughtering or attempting or if wanting we're not, to slaughter, if we're not, a, a if we're not arranging a, Passover lamb, a man be putting a barley. ring on a woman's finger, there are there are a number of There's things. So many in, things let me we explain can do to that you. Are, we're that very are evil. Bad. Okay, we're very bad. We're dark, dick dastardly. Let me explain to you the portfolio. These are men, these Temple Institute people, whose nefarious activities range from the preparation of would-be Passover offerings to cutting barley in fields to actually clandestinely supervising the, the betrothal of a wonderful Jewish woman on the Temple Mount. These are people who, in the words of one of the left-wing Knesset members, have to be snuffed out they have to be dealt with they have to be dealt with they have to be confronted they have to be their funds have to be cut off and we have to recognize this terrible cancer that's in our midst so that when unesco comes along and says the temple mount isn't yours we can stand there like bedraggled uh um exiled uh, jew jewish jews and we can put our little tail between our legs, and we can stand there, and we can nod our heads, and we can apologize for existing, and we can allow them to wipe us out, to wipe our past out, to deny that we've ever been here, that we have anything to... And then soon, you'll wonder, like, you know, the go you, government of Israel, will wonder how you're going to deal with the world saying that you're not here at all, that, you're, that you're, your whole existence in this land is a provocation. But you're going to say, what do you mean? There's archaeological evidence, there's the Bible, of course we've been here, you're rewriting history. No. No, you're rewriting history, but you're not allowing you, Netanyahu, but you're not allowing the Jewish people to pray on the Temple Mount, to act like Jews. You're denying Jewish history. So what do you expect from UNESCO? So that is exactly the... And that's a Passover message. Yes, yeah, God, that's exactly me. the lamb. That, that is a Passover message. That's what slaughtering the Passover lamb is all about. It's about taking a stand. It might not be politically correct. It might not be popular. It might not win you a lot of friends. But you know what? You only go around once. Or do you? And the fact is, you have to take a stand for what's right. Either this is just some sort of board game. Either this is just you know, a diversion, or we are actually created in the image of God, and we are to take a stand for His honor. And that's what Passover is all about. And that's what Passover is all about. We still have a couple of minutes, but Rabbi, I think I'd like to begin by uh, taking a few moments now to wish everyone a very, very, very happy, joyous, joy-filled, liberating Passover while you're at your Passover Seder that... Uh, you should dwell on the fact that it really is all about the Korban Pesach, the Passover offering. That's really what we should be doing. And don't take it for granted. And don't uh, lose sight of that. Keep your eye focused on, on, on what it's all about, which is that Korban Pesach, which is the liberating uh, catalyst uh, that, uh, as we've been saying, slays us, slays all the various uh, idolatries and political uh, political knots that we find ourselves tied in these days. Um, be true. Be true to our heritage.
be true to our destiny, and uh, that will itself make it a very, very, very happy and joyous Passover. Time to set the captives free. Time to set the captives free, and those captives captives be us. They be us. They be us. They be us, we, but it's the shackles of our own minds. Ooh, we're getting so poetic. But um, seriously, folks, have a wonderful Passover, and we will Chag be back Hashem at you uh, on uh, Sunday with the counting of the of the uh, the Omer, Sfirat Omer. Like the rabbi said, we have something planned this year, which hopefully will be very engaging and uh, very exciting, and will carry us all through together 49 days of the counting, which will then lead us to Shavuot. Here's that music, Rabbi. So let's together wish everybody a Chag Chag Kasher Kasher Sameach. Sameach. happy and kosher Passover from the Temple Institute. We'll be back in two weeks. Temple Talk.